There are certain roles of the musical theater that become immortalized by the people that first played them. Such instances can only be described as a unique moment where a role and performer meet so perfectly in time, creating an excitement in the theater that can never be repeated. One of the greatest examples of this, of course, is Barbara Streisand's performance as Fanny Bryce in Funny Girl. She opened the show on Broadway in 1964, and four years later, played the role again in the movie version, where she won the Academy Award for Best Leading Actress. Hello, gorgeous. <laughs> the role has since become entwined with the memory of Barbara Streisand, to the point that finding an actress to play the role in her stead is not only thought of as daunting, but near impossible. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the making of Funny Girl, how the show launched Barbara Streisand into stardom, and we're also going to be delving into the real-life Fanny Bryce herself, and how her story contrasts with the one reflected in the musical. If you're not familiar with Funny Girl, don't worry, because we're going to be getting into it along the way. And yes, we are definitely going to be talking about the upcoming revival, which will mark the first Broadway production of the show since its premiere in 1964. Hello, gorgeous. Before we get started, if you're brand new to this channel, make sure to like this video, hit that subscribe button, and make sure to check out some of my other episodes. For Funny Girl, the road to Broadway was a long one, and it all started with this guy, Ray Stark, a Hollywood agent turned producer who just happened to be married to Frances Bryce, the only daughter of Fanny Bryce. In 1961, he sought to produce a movie about the life of his late mother-in-law. After rejecting several written treatments, he ultimately settled with writer Isabel Leonard and her screenplay titled My Man. After reading this treatment, it was Broadway actress Mary Martin that suggested it would play better as a Broadway musical, starring herself, of course. Not accustomed to the Broadway theater scene, Ray Stark enlisted David Merrick as his co-producer, who had recently found success with the original production of Gypsy. From Gypsy, he would enlist Jerome Robbins as the show's director and choreographer, along with Julie Stein and Stephen Sondheim to write the show's score. But Sondheim soon withdrew upon learning of Mary Martin's attachment to the project. From his perspective, it was important that a Jewish actress play the part. After a time, Mary Martin would eventually leave the project herself, reportedly dissatisfied with Isabel Leonard's script. With Bob Merrill now hired to pen the lyrics, the search began for the show's leading lady. Edie Gourmet was approached, but would only do it if her husband Steve Lawrence was considered to play Nicky Arnstein. They said no. Anne Bancroft was in serious contention for a time, but after sitting down to hear the show's score, she declined, saying that it was far beyond her capabilities. Jerome Robbins eventually approached Carol Burnett to play the part, but she too turned it down, gently telling Robbins, you need a Jewish girl for this. Now, as much as I love Carol Burnett and understand why Jerome Robbins may have considered her, something about her playing this role doesn't intuitively make sense for being Jewish was incredibly important to Fanny Bryce's stage persona. Fania Borak was a first-generation American, but her parents, like countless others, had been part of a wave of immigrants traveling to the United States at the turn of the 20th century. Cities like Manhattan had become cultural melting pots of customs, languages, and accents all converging together, and from a very young age, Fanny developed a keen ear and the ability to mimic everything she heard. She began performing in burlesque as a teenager, long before the advent of the striptease. Before the 1930s, burlesque was a more innocent form of entertainment, satirizing topics of the day with sketches and musical acts. It was here that she first honed her craft, deliberately creating a gawky stage persona, bugging eyes and gleefully mugging to the audience, not afraid to act a fool and be applauded for it. Fanny didn't seem all that bothered by not being seen as a great beauty at least not yet. Eventually, she changed her billing from Borak to Bryce. The Bryces were family friends, and the surname was easier to pronounce, not overtly ethnic, as she would later say. Soon, that wouldn't matter though. In 1908, Fanny was in need of a specialty number and sought the help of a song plugger working in Tin Pan Alley. So, the young Irving Berlin proceeded to play one of his new songs, Sadie Salome, and told her to sing it with a fake Yiddish accent. 
As Herman Goldman wrote, Sadie Salam sparked something in Fanny. Her sense of fun, of the risque, was made for Berlin's song, as was her proclivity for eye-rolling comment on outrageous situations. At 17, Fanny Bryce had found her niche, and throughout her career, it was more often than not to see her play a broad, dithering woman with a thick Yiddish accent, putting on airs while posturing above her own class. Such characterizations could be read as stereotypical or even racist from another performer, but from Fanny, however broad the performance, it was always from an authentic place. In 1936, she would explain, In anything Jewish I ever did, I wasn't standing apart, making fun. I was the race, and what happened to me is what could happen to my people. They identified with me, which made it all right to get a laugh. This was becoming a tall order. The role of Fanny Bryce demanded an actress with an incredible voice who could play broad comedy as well as drama. Where would the creative team find such a performer? who could authentically imbue the spirit of such a beloved comedienne. If you were living in New York City around this point in time, you might have heard the name Barbara Streisand making the rounds in Greenwich Village. When she first started singing in small nightclubs in 1960, no one had ever heard anything like her. The power and expressiveness of her voice could easily be compared with the likes of Judy Garland and Lena Horne, but her tone, her phrasing, her intonation were so uniquely hers, and her street-smart, quirky, and nonchalant candidness made audiences fall in love with her. In 1961, director Arthur Lawrence invited Barbara to audition for his new musical, I Can Get It For You Wholesale, which was met incredulously by the show's producer, our friend David Merrick, who reportedly said, How many times have I told you I don't want ugly girls in my shows? Regardless, Barbara was cast in a featured role as the oft-neglected secretary, Miss Marmelstein, and on opening night, her act two number stopped the show cold. For her Broadway debut, she received glowing notices, a Tony nomination, and eventually a recording contract with Columbia Records. In May of 1962, the New York Times innocently likened Barbra Streisand to Fanny Bryce. But by then, the creative team of Funny Girl may have already had their eyes on her, eventually taking in one of her performances downtown at the nightclub Bonsoir. Ray Stark brought his wife Fran along, who was, well, not taken with Barbara, like in any way, especially at the prospect of playing her mother. She was reportedly put off by Barbara's quirky and ethnic manner, later saying, Mother was a comic, but she was never a nut. In the summer of 1963, Barbara began the intensive audition process for Funny Girl. While wanting to ensure she could pull off this mammoth role, the creative team also had genuine concerns about casting her at all. Never a technically trained performer, Barbara could come off as undisciplined and mercurial, with directors and producers constantly needing to rein her in. But, understanding how high the stakes were, Barbara sought director Alan Miller to coach her through the material. She would go on to attend seven callbacks, and after impressing the creative team in her final audition, Ray Stark announced that Barbara Streisand would play Fanny Bryce in Funny Girl. At 21, she had been offered a golden opportunity, and like the real Fanny Bryce, a golden opportunity would change her life forever. <laughs> In 1910, Fanny Bryce received a telegram that simply read, Will you come to see me at your earliest convenience? Stop, Florent Ziegfeld. Today, Ziegfeld is best remembered for his grand and lavish reviews and glorifying the American girl with his scantily clad Koreans and showgirls. Some may have thought it odd for him to have asked the likes of Fanny Bryce to join his review, but Ziegfeld appreciated talent and knew that a varied bill of performers only made his shows better. He offered her a two-year contract at $75 a week for the first year and $100 a week for the second. With her contract in hand, she stood in the middle of Times Square, showing it to everyone who passed her by. Fanny's performances in the Follies of 1910 were well received, but it was not the apocryphal overnight sensation story we commonly think of today. She was one of many acts, and back then, that was enough for her. Her relationship with Ziegfeld was largely professional and cordial, 
But for one reason or another, he decided not to extend her contract after her second year. Instead, she was quickly signed on by the Schuberts at $450 a week for their traveling review in 1912. It was during the tour's Baltimore engagement that Fanny first met Julius Wilford Arnstein, whom Eddie Cantor once remembered as the best actor Fanny ever saw. A man of many aliases, most people called him Nick. Taken by his manner, his intelligence, and charm, Fanny quickly fell for him, and by the tour's next stop in Philadelphia, the two of them had begun an affair. Not everyone was taken by this supposed businessman, for he was never able to explain what his business actually was. After some coaxing from friends, Fanny ended up hiring a private investigator. They brought back reports of a man with crooked business schemes, but more crucially to Fanny, Nick Arnstein was still very much a married man. Surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, Fanny decided not to reproach him, instead deciding to wait six years for the means for his divorce. In the meantime, Fanny devoted every moment she had not performing to Nick, taking part in his lavish lifestyle, staying in fine hotels and dining in luxurious restaurants. All of this, of course, was paid with her money, and at times, to keep up with his way of living, Fanny would pawn off her jewelry. The first of many reality checks came in 1915, when Nick Ernstein was indicted for wiretapping. Fanny paid a whopping $25,000 for his bail, and pressed for funds, she began performing on the vaudeville stage, where she could make $1,000 a week. After months of appeals, Arnstein was sentenced to serve 18 months in prison at Sing Sing Correctional Facility, where Fanny, ever devoted to him, pulled many strings to make his stay as comfortable as possible, granting him many privileges and visiting him at least once a week with a home-cooked meal. In 1916, Fanny made a rather triumphant return to the Ziegfeld Follies, and was now considered a Ziegfeld staple and a Broadway favorite. Though by this point, theater had become a trade for Fanny, something she did with great pride and integrity, but did not live by. This would be reserved for Nick Arnstein. Fanny spent much of his prison sentence worrying about him, losing sleep, and developing insomnia that she would battle for the rest of her life. By 1919, Nick was out of prison, finally divorced from his former wife, and now married to Fanny. But within a year, he would face a further indictment, wrapped up in a supposed plot to steal $5 million of security bonds from various Wall Street brokerage firms. To the end of his life, Arnstein would claim he was framed. A trial was imminent, and to prevent Nick from receiving even more jail time, Fanny reluctantly sought Arnold Rothstein, a kingpin of the Jewish mob, to post his $100,000 bail. In 1921, while Nick Arnstein appealed in court, Fanny began rehearsals for the newest edition of the Ziegfeld Follies. She was given a new song, Mon Homme, which had premiered the year before in Paris. For the dress rehearsal, Fanny entered the stage dressed to the nines in a black velvet dress, ballroom shoes, donning a bright red wig. Ziegfeld said she looked like a female impersonator. If this was a way for Fanny to distance herself from the gravity of the song, Ziegfeld would have none of it. Leaning against a lamppost, wearing an ash-smeared dress and a wool wrap, Fanny Bryce performed My Man for the first time in Atlantic City on June 14, 1921. Critics mostly praised Fanny's comedy numbers in the Follies that year, but couldn't help but be drawn to this new song. Now, while I'd like to, I can't play the song for you here, but let's just say the parallels between the song and Fanny Bryce's questionable devotion were not hard to find here. Unsurprisingly, Nick Arnstein hated being associated with the song. He took particular issue with a lyric that suggested he beat Fanny. He didn't. Regardless, her performance of My Man showed Fanny Bryce to be a performer of greater depth and versatility than her body of work might have suggested by that point. The song has since become a standard of sorts, and marked a major triumph for the Ziegfeld Follies, partly attributed to Ziegfeld, but mostly thanks to Fanny Bryce. After scheduled tryouts in Boston and Philadelphia, Funny Girl was slated to open on Broadway in February 1964. 
In the months leading up to the first day of rehearsal, the creative team continued to develop the show, which would see some shuffling behind the scenes. Director Jerome Robbins constantly had issues with Isabel Leonard's script, and when Ray Stark refused to fire her, Robbins quit. Bob Fosse was brought on as a replacement, but after only a few weeks, he too would quit the show. Apparently, he did stay long enough to contribute to the show's opening scene and this iconic line. Hello, gorgeous. Both in their own time with the show, Robbins and Fosse found issue with parts of the show's score, particularly with the song People, which gave Barbara Streisand a fabulous moment on stage, but made very little sense for the character of Fanny to sing. Press as to why she should be singing the song at all, Julie Stein told Bob Fosse, because this song is going to be fucking number one on the hit parade. In the fall, Ray Stark finally hired Garson Kanan as the show's new director, only to find more headaches with his co-producer, David Merrick. The two had had a falling out, and by October, Merrick would sell back his shares of the show, giving Stark absolute control over Funny Girl. Except when it came to his wife, Fran. She may not have had her way with the casting of her mother, but she would hold sway over the casting of Nikki Arnstein, favoring Sidney Chaplin over pretty much everyone else's preferred choice, Jerry Orbach. The out-of-town tryouts for Funny Girl were rocky, to say the least. The show ran four hours in Boston, and reviews were not encouraging. At one point, Barbara Streisand and Sidney Chaplin hated each other so much that he would quietly heckle her during their scenes together. The show's Philadelphia engagement saw Julie Stein and Bob Merrill writing, rewriting, and cutting huge swaths out of the show's score. Stein would later claim he wrote around 56 songs for Funny Girl. And Isabel Leonard's book was constantly evolving, with playwright John Patrick and Norman Krasna, co-author of the movie White Christmas, both in their own time acting as script doctors. Garson Kanan, who had never directed a musical, seemed to gradually lose control over the piece, and after some campaigning from Barbara, Ray Stark brought Jerome Robbins back, joining the company as an overall consultant for a reported fee of $1,000 a day. In the history of musical theater and classical ballet, Jerome Robbins is such a crucial and influential figure, but there are also plenty of stories about his, um, questionable directing methods that could sometimes veer towards manipulative and abusive. While he was reportedly in better form working on Funny Girl, he was still very hard on choreographer Carol Haney, who had been hired under Bob Fosse's reign of the show. Eventually, Haney would be fired, and Garson Kanan would bow out on his own accord, leaving Robbins to work as a production supervisor. Now, not discounting his irate behavior, but the changes Jerome Robbins made immediately began to improve the show, which included the shuffling of scenes and restaging of musical numbers. Impressed with what she had done with the role already, and understanding what he had with her, Robbins reshaped Funny Girl to let Barbara and her particular talents shine through, in essence, letting Barbara be Barbara, and taking focus off of the show's weaker elements. One example was the number You Are Woman, I Am Man, which had initially been conceived as a solo for Nick as he attempts to seduce Fanny. But the number, as written for Sidney Chaplin, was falling flat. So Robbins had Stein and Merrill write a counter melody with comedy lyrics to let the audience know what Fanny was thinking throughout the seduction. The addition to the number immediately worked and became a show highlight much to the chagrin of Sidney Chaplin, whose Nicky Arnstein was gradually whittled away from the show. Ray Stark postponed the Broadway opening five times so that Jerome Robbins could rework the show. The show's final dressing room scene, which had been rewritten more than 50 times, was only finally set and rehearsed three hours before the opening night curtain. In this final version, Nick is released from prison and he decides at best that he and Fanny part and end their relationship. Heartbroken, but determined, Fanny sings a rousing reprise of Don't Rain On My Parade, and the curtain falls on a triumphant note. For the Fanny Bryce who had to live it, however, it was a bit more complicated than that. By 1927, Fanny and Nick had been together for 15 years, and in that time, he had been indicted and served jail time twice, creating a tremendous amount of press and speculation about his relationship with Fanny. She still may have loved Nick, but the last few years had hardened her. 
she began to see past the sophisticated veneer that she had once been charmed by. She had supported and funded many of his business ventures, only to see them flounder under his waning interest. Fanny had become very successful and very rich in her own right, a fact that Nick came to resent. His infidelity, which Fanny had pardoned and excused for years, had also become more brash and flagrant. Finally, in June of 1927, after learning of yet another indiscretion, Fanny had had enough. In actuality, it was Fanny who ended the relationship, filing for divorce under the grounds of adultery. After the divorce was finalized in September, Nick Arnstein disappeared from Fanny's life, and in large part, from the lives of his own children. It's not wholly productive to break down fact from fiction between the real-life Fanny Bryce and the character presented in Funny Girl. The show has always presented itself as a loosely based telling of her story rather than a true-to-life biography. But I do think there's more to her story than the musical leaves us with. In the end, Fanny returns to the stage and rises victoriously as the curtain falls. But maybe it's closer to the truth that she only returned to the stage because there was nowhere else for her to go. Fanny Bryce was not a fool and did not suffer them either. She was also a generous spirit and astute judge of character. It's curious then to note the lapse in judgment when it came to romantic love. She would be married and divorced three times in her life, including to songwriter Billy Rose, who wrote much of Fanny's new material after her divorce from Nick Arnstein. This, by the way, includes the song I'd Rather Be Blue, which was interpolated into the movie version of Funny Girl. But like Nick, Billy Rose was unfaithful to Fanny, using her and her connections to further his own career as a producer. In spite of her troubled marriage to Rose, he did help her transition into motion pictures, with star vehicles like Be Yourself, which is available on YouTube and I have linked below. While it's definitely a movie of its time, it's also a wonderful record of Fanny Bryce as a performer. Many songs in the film came directly from her vaudeville act, giving us the closest idea to her stage performances, and I think you'll be surprised at how much they can still make you laugh. Unfortunately, the film did poorly, and reviewers were critical of Fanny Bryce's performance. Watching the movie today, she does shine best in the musical numbers. And while her dramatic moments are far more subdued and less showy, there's still an honesty and earnestness about her that I quite admire. You're a funny girl, Fanny. I gotta be. That's how I make my living. But critics of the time were constantly drawing attention to her age, she wasn't yet 40 then, and how the role would have been best suited for an ingenue. Never seen as a great beauty, critics, and in large part her own audience, only wanted to see her as a wacky comedian rather than a dramatic actress. So rather than changing her image and how the public saw her, she embraced it, leaning heavily into a caricature of herself, if only so it would keep her working. Miss Bryce, you're supposed to be a judge of this beauty contest. A judge? Who's a judge? I'm a beauty. What qualifications have you for beauty? Didn't I win the beauty contest in 1923? I was Mrs. Needles from Arizona. After Be Yourself, she only made a handful of appearances on film throughout her career, including the chance to play herself in The Great Ziegfeld, a romanticized telling of the life of Florence Ziegfeld. In it, Ziegfeld discovers and invites Fanny to join the Follies, where he promptly assigns her My Man and makes her an overnight star. Like many biographical movies of this time, facts weren't always the driving forces here. What's interesting in this movie is while supposedly playing herself, she's actually donning her stage persona, playing the caricature of herself with the fake Yiddish accent and bugging, mugging eyes. Once in Burlicue, always in Burlicue. Unless you got looks or voice or something. Well, that's what I got, kid. What? Something. Fanny, on the... Whatever liberties were taken, The Great Ziegfeld was a major success, going on to win the Academy Award for Best Picture. In the years of the Depression, there was already a fond, nostalgic feeling about Florence Ziegfeld, even after the crash of his empire, which left a mountain of debt for his widow, Billy Burke. Or, as most of us know her... I'm Glinda, the Witch of the North. 
In one of many efforts to pay off his debt, Billy Burke signed an agreement with the Schuberts to produce a new edition of the Ziegfeld Follies, where Fanny Bryce signed on to appear and received top billing. The 1936 Ziegfeld Follies would end up playing at the Winter Garden Theater, the same theater that Funny Girl would play almost 30 years later. The show was notable for one of the first major appearances of Fanny's newest character, Baby Snooks, which she would recreate in the 1938 film Everybody Sing, sharing the screen with a young pre-Wizard of Oz Judy Garland. The role would ultimately lead Fanny to a successful career in radio, playing Baby Snooks through much of the 1940s, where she would go on to earn a whopping $5,000 a week. By this point, the American musical theater was changing, and with the end of vaudeville, performers like Fanny Bryce soon saw their stage work disappear. She was in poor health for her last years, and while radio wasn't as physically grueling as the stage, she found the work less than satisfying. When networks proposed transitioning the Baby Snooks show to television, Fanny was apprehensive. She intuitively understood that television would override radio, and however well the character read on the airwaves, to see a middle-aged woman nearing 60 in a child's outfit would strain the suspension of disbelief. Fanny had no illusions or ego about her career. Her ambition to perform had largely cooled, and after signing on for another year of The Baby Snooks Show in 1950, she planned to retire. This was cut short, however, in May of 1951, after a severe cerebral hemorrhage put her in a coma, of which she never awoke, finally passing away at the age of 59. Funny Girl opened on Broadway in March of 1964, and in large part was considered a success thanks to Barbara Streisand. It would go on to be nominated for eight Tony Awards that year, ultimately being shut out by that year's other seismic hit, Hello Dolly, which was produced by our old friend David Merrick. But with Barbara's rave reviews, a television special, and album releases, Funny Girl remained a hit throughout Barbara's run, and before she finished her time on Broadway, Ray Stark signed with Columbia Pictures to produce the movie version of Funny Girl. The only stipulation? Barbara Streisand had to play Fanny. Barbara's reception in the film matched the acclaim she found on Broadway, and for her first movie role, she won the Academy Award for Best Leading Actress, tying with Katharine Hepburn. For more on this, go visit the YouTube channel Be Kind Rewind and check out their episode on this Oscar win. The film did receive criticism that echoed reviews from Funny Girl's Broadway run, mainly how old-fashioned the show was and how the supporting characters were underdeveloped and read more as stock characters. But with Barbara Streisand's commanding performance, you don't really think about that. In rewatching the movie for this episode, it really is astonishing how well this performance holds up. The role fits her like a glove, to the point that the show really has more to do with Barbara Streisand than Fanny Bryce. So what happens when another actress takes on this iconic role in the shadow of Barbara Streisand? If you take a dive on YouTube, you will see that many women, like Stephanie J. Block, Leslie Kritzer, and Shoshana Bean have had their own go at the role in regional theater productions. But for the longest time, Funny Girl has been notable for never having received a big commercial Broadway revival. While not an actual revival, a production of note was the Actors Fund benefit performance of the show in 2002, hosted at the New Amsterdam Theater, the former home of Ziegfeld and his Follies. The role of Fanny Bryce was shared by over a dozen Broadway actresses. Quick note, if you have not seen Lilius White's performance of Don't Rain in My Parade from this benefit, you truly have not lived. There had been plans for a 2012 Broadway revival starring Lauren Ambrose and Bob Cannavale, but that was unfortunately cancelled after key investors pulled out in spite of sets and costumes being constructed. Ryan Murphy reportedly held the stage rights for a time, and Leia Michelle um, aggressively campaigned to play this role. Sorry everyone, I'm not going anywhere near this one. Then in 2015, the Menier Chocolate Factory in London mounted a brand new revival 
directed by Broadway's Michael Mayer, with Harvey Firestein giving revisions to the book. The show quickly sold out and was transferred to the West End, the first time the show had played there since Barbara's opening of the show in 1966. The production later toured the UK and was recorded for film. Sheridan Smith's committed performance as Fanny never once tries to be like Barbara Streisand, which is honestly one of the best things you can say about it. Her commendable and refreshing take on the role shows that it is actually more pliable than just being a Barbara Streisand vehicle. And thank God, because after nearly 60 years, Funny Girl is finally returning to the Broadway stage, with Beanie Feldstein playing Fanny Bryce. The production will once again be directed by Michael Mayer, with Harvey Firestein returning to revise the book. We can probably expect a very different physical production from the London version, with presumably even further revisions to Isabel Leonard's script. There is a lot of promise in the casting so far. Ramin Karamlu as Nikki Arnstein is an especially inspired choice, but nothing beats my excitement for Beanie Feldstein's casting as Fanny Bryce. For some, it may have seemed like an unexpected choice, but if you've seen the range she demonstrates in movies like Lady Bird, Booksmart, and FX's Impeachment American Crime Story, you know there is a lot to look forward to here. I sometimes wonder what Fanny Bryce would have thought of Funny Girl had she lived to see it. Fanny was a private person, never prone to show emotion in public or express the disappointments she experienced in life. Being thwarted in love time and time again never really being regarded as anything but a wacky comedienne. She would never betray those feelings, of course. How ironic is it that in immortalizing her, Barbara Streisand was able to showcase facets of Fanny Bryce that she was never able to, and in doing so, launching into stardom that far eclipsed that of Fanny's. Today, people still fall in love with Barbara Streisand's performance in the movie version of Funny Girl, while having no idea that Fanny Bryce was a real person. Which is a shame, really, but also not surprising. Fanny Bryce was in essence a stage performer, and her memory doesn't loom in pop culture the way that Barbara's does. Fanny's filmography was not extensive, and the racialized characterizations she became known for on the stage are very much of their time and let's say have not aged all too well. While one might have to reconcile the difference between Funny Girl's Fanny Bryce and the real-life Fanny Bryce, the two still have a lot in common. Setting aside the Nikki Arnstein romance, Funny Girl is ultimately about a woman finding success on her own terms. In spite of the many obstacles she faces, she finds the confidence and agency to forge her own path towards that success. And in the wake of her success, a door is opened for another to follow, and in doing so, her story lives on. And yet another door is opened. And when you really think about it, Fanny Bryce helped open a hell of a lot of doors. Now that is a legacy to be remembered by. A big thank you to all the individuals who helped contribute to this episode, including online resources like the Fanny Bryce Collection and the Barbara Archives, run by Matt Howe. These sites were invaluable to my research, and I have linked them in the description. What are your hopes for the upcoming revival? Do you have any funny girl memories you'd like to share? Let me know in the comments. A big shout out to everyone who helped bring this channel to over a thousand subscribers in the last couple weeks. And if you're brand new to this channel and want to see more of this content, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Till next time, stay tuned.